in McLeod, a professor emeritus of structural engineering, University yes. of Strathclyde. Thank you very much. Let's welcome. Well, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, your first question, I'm sure, is uh, what is structural mechanics? Well, it is the uh, logic and the procedures used uh, to ensure that structures perform satisfactorily. And you can see from this slide, it's, it's applied to a very wide range of different engineering activities, buildings, bridges, ships, aircraft, machinery. So it's a very pervasive uh, technology in engineering. Uh, in order to explain to you Maxwell's role, I, will need, I would like to give you a, a whistle-stop tour of the history of structural mechanics in two minutes. Uh, Galileo Galileo, I, at the end of his life in the uh, 17th century, must have thought that uh, working on structural mechanics would be a bit less dangerous than working on, 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 on astronomy, more unli less likely to have him uh, stretched in the rack with that. So he did this, uh, got this drawn, this wonderful uh, diagram drawn. You don't get diagrams like that nowadays. You don't get that quality nowadays. <laughs> and uh, his, he, he posed a very important question. He said, here's a beam, cantilever beam uh, from a wall, and it takes a load in the end. How do we calculate the strength of that beam? And he had a go at it, but he failed. He, he had a nice try, but he wasn't really very close to it. Now, the interesting thing is the applied scientists of Europe for 200 years tried to crack the problem of bending, including this guy, Leonard Euler, who was a, a, a major genius like, like Clark Maxwell. And of course, he did his uh, stability c calculation, but he didn't get bending right. He made a mistake also. And it wasn't, an, and Thomas Telford in the early 19th century was disappointed that the applied uh, scientists of the day could not help him much in these wonderful masterpieces of bridges that he, he built. <coughs> and then in 1826, this man, Louis Navier, and you guessed it right, Louis Navier is the same Navier as the Navier-Stokes equation, and he published his lesson, his lecture notes. Uh, and these were, in, the, in the, these lessons on 1826, he produced the theory of bending which we now use. And he also uh, wrote a lot of very other useful things. So this, was, this publication of this lesson was the dawn of structural mechanics, and it was the curtain opener to the production of structural mechanics in the 18th, 19th century, in which Maxwell played a major part. So what part did he play? His first paper was this one on the equilibrium of elastic solids. Uh, this would come under the heading of strength of materials, and it's a uh, an astonishingly mature paper for a man who is not yet 19. This paper was presented to the, the Royal Society of Edinburgh by his professor of mathematics because he was still felt to be too young to present it himself. So what he did was he, he re-derived the equation, the differential equations of elasticity uh, starting from a different point from what other people had done, but getting the same result as people like Cauchy and Navier. He then proceeded to apply this, these equations, solve them for a number of cases. Uh, this, I'm only going to show you three. The first one here is the torsion of a cylinder, uh, a very commonly used relationship that he derived. We call it now the St. Venom theory. I'm not sure if St. Venom did it before he did but it would appear he, what he did was original to him. Uh, so this is a well-used result. He re-established re the theory of bending, noting that he got the same as Navier, and he also uh, worked out the solution of a beam in bending that included shear deformation. This is the shear deformation component, and this is normally included in, in the analysis that we do nowadays in the computer. He made an error in this in his solution here, but it was a, a, an interesting um, uh, solution all the same. And all these solutions are used as standard in modern structural analysis. In order to seek to work out the elastic constants, he used this method of photoelasticity 
which was a, 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 a phenomenon observed by David Brewster earlier in the century, where if you pass polarized light through what's called a birefringent material, you get these uh, uh, patterns which represent strain. They didn't know exactly what it was at the beginning, but it represents strain. And using that, you can see here, he, um, he gets the, the stress or strain or pattern for torsion. Now, uh, this method uh, was had limited use after Maxwell. He was probably the first person to apply photoelasticity in a practical way, um, <coughs> but it's not used anymore. A lot of the stuff has been overtaken by computers, as I'll explain to you later. Now, before I, I move on to explaining his other papers, I want to give you a demonstration here. Uh, so I take, I go, I produce this from behind the curtain. And uh, here is a simple frame. And it doesn't have a, it's, it's not triangulated. And it's not, a, it's not a structure at all. We call this a mechanism, right? Now, if you put in a single diagonal, that's enough to make it a, a structure. And that will just has just enough members in it to make it able to support ro load, and we call this a statically determinate frame. And the, the feature of this type of frame is you can work out the forces in it by the principle of equilibrium only. But then, if we put an extra diagonal in the second diagonal, we've got more members than we really needed, and uh, it's stiffer, but in order to solve it, it's much more difficult. Now, Maxwell addressed this problem and this problem. So his his f papers on uh, excuse me on reciprocal figures. He had five of them, and he um, he worked out methods of a method of solving the forces in statically determinate frames of this type. He didn't actually uh, invent the method. I think other people did, like <coughs> McCorn Rankin. But what Maxwell did was to explain the theory behind the method. And he developed it so that there was uh, to explain how it could be developed into three dimensions, although it, that really didn't take on in practice. So let me give you a, an example of reciprocal diagrams. <laughs> Here is a very simple frame with a taking a, a load of 100 newtons in the center, and it support reactions of 50 newtons and 50 newtons here. Now, what we want to do is to find the internal forces in the members. And you, if we take node 1 here, I've marked on the directions of the forces at that member. And if you take these forces and draw, you can draw a polygon. In this case, a, a triangle. You can draw a triangle of forces will represent the, the equilibrium. So you draw the triangle of forces for one here, and here it is A, E, E, D, D, A. So that is the triangle of forces for this point. So now you take node 5, and you draw the, the, the polygon of forces here. It's again a triangle. And you use this side here, and you draw the, the, the diagram for that. And finally, node 3 is here. So what, you have, what, is, what is done is the frame here has been turned through 90 degrees. And this is the reciprocal diagram of forces. And in this frame here, the, the node here, or the, the joint is one, uh, is at a point, but one represents a triangle, a space here. So a, a point here represents a space here, and vice versa. So it's a, 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 a reciprocal relationship. And this method uh, was used extensively in, to solve frames in the 19th and in the 20th centuries. When I studied uh, structural mechanics in the mid-20th century, we were taught how to do this. This is a modern bridge, uh, very similar to this one. This is from Fleming Jenkins' book. And you can see the reciprocal figure uh, set out here, the, the most heavily loaded member is TH, and you can see that in the center of the diagram. So this was a method that was used for uh, 100 years. And uh, uh, 
it, however, Maxwell's explanation of it are not well remembered because it, they, they, he didn't actually move the, the technique on a, a, a great much. So this, the third second, sorry, the third example is on the calculation and equilibrium of frames, and this is Maxwell's great masterpiece in structural mechanics. Uh, he developed a range of techniques for solving indeterminate triangular frames, and I'm going to explain these to you. So the first, oh, sorry, before you start, this is this is a starting point. He says I started with Clapeyron's theorem of conservation of energy, and he also had one or two quite simple relationships. This is the, stif the force deformation relationship. This is the axial stiffness, and he defines work. So that's a starting point. Uh, and now, b before I move on, I need to explain to you, when you're solving a frame like this, you need to have three requirements. This one, equilibrium will do, but this one here, there are three requirements. First of all, you need the force deformation relationship. Secondly, you need uh, equilibrium, which is really Newton's third law. And th thirdly, you need compatibility. Now, the compatibility condition is that th this, these, the ends of these members are bolted together. And the bolt at the end of the member makes sure that this member moves along with that member. That's the compatibility condition that, uh, uh, that says if, if this point here and this member moves, this one goes by the same amount. That's compatibility, OK? So. He started by uh, working out if you have uh, a frame, how many extra members does it have? And if you apply this simple formula to these frames, you get this one that I showed you is minus one. It's short of a member to make a structure. This one here is z zero, doesn't need it. It's got the right number. And this one's got an extra a member. So this simple formula to work out how many uh, uh, unknowns there were in his method. So the second one is the principle of contragredience. He didn't call it that. He just said this is a theorem. But this principle of contragredience is now used extensively in, uh, in the theory of structures for, com for computing. So I'm going to explain it to you uh, quite quickly. And effectively, what we have is I'll just go to the, the matrix relationship here. If you have a set of forces, P2, and you want to know the relationship between these two sets of forces, P2 and P1, there, this is a linear relationship between the two, right? So what the principle of contragredience says is that the, 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 second, the third requirement of compatibility is given by this reciprocal relationship. You take this. This, the, this is P1, here's delta 1 equals C delta 2, where C is the transpose. This is the, the equilibrium matrix, and this is the compatibility matrix. And one is the transpose of the other, and it's a, bit, it's a reciprocal relationship, just like the previous one, because if you think of your, your uh, matrix algebra, the transposition of a matrix turns it through 90 degrees. Right? So very, very simple relationship between compatibility and equilibrium. In fact, to some degree, they're the same thing. And that was a, is a very interesting, uh, you'd think that how it fits together and the equilibrium are quite different. Not, they're, they're, they've got a fundamental requirement for them is that they both, they need to be, both need to be in contact to transmit the force and to, sub, to satisfy the condition. So we, we used, I, I used this extensively when I was a young man writing software for computer frame analysis and other problems. Uh, and I, I, I must admit, I, find, I, I really enjoyed using it because it's so elegant that you would be able to, if you want to make a transformation between, on this stiffness relationship, you pre-multiply it by the, the equilibrium matrix and you post-multiply it by the, the compatibility matrix and you only need to do one of these things. Uh, if you write this one, you can get the, the, the equilibrium, you get the, the, the compatibility right away. And it was, it was a very, very, I found it, I really enjoyed working, using that. 
Uh, so the next thing is the unit load method, which comes from the directly from the principle of compatibility. Uh, if you um, what the problem we had was we've got a a load on the structure here, and we want to know what a deflection on the structure due to this load is at any point. Well, from the the uh, reciprocal diagrams or other methods, you can find the internal forces. But what what he wants to do is he, and from that you can calculate whether the mem and, and the amount of extension or compression of the member. But how do you then, having got that information, how do you find out what how these movements of the structure affect the deflection at any position? Now it's a geometrical problem, and it's, it's solvable, of course. But it's not all that easy. But the, the reciprocal problem of having a, a load in the direction of the, of the required deformation, and what, is, what are the internal forces in the structure, that's easy to do. So that's what Maxwell did. He used the principle of equilibrium through the, the, via the uh, contragradients method in order to find the deflection. And that, so that's what the unit load method does. Uh, and he, so that, that it was a means uh, of calculating the, the geometry of the structure using equilibrium. That's pretty smart, isn't it? And so then he had the tools to do the job, and he could calculate the deflections along the diagonal here. He said, OK, take what the, one of the diagonals out is redundant and replace that with the, a loading on the structure and a load along the diagonal and if you, you can work out then the, some of the deflections along the diagonal, set them to zero, and you, that, you can solve that then for the diagonal force R, and you've got it. That's in one, with one uh, degree, one, one uh, redundant, of course, as you build it up um, that with more, uh, more redundant method elements, you get uh, a set of simultaneous equations. So that's it. that is the sometimes called the maxwell more in modern times, the flexibility method of solving indeterminate frames. Maxwell almost certainly was the first person to devise this. Moore de developed it later on with different notation, which was more popular, because Maxwell's paper, six pages, very dense, difficult, uh, difficult notation, no diagrams, not one diagram in his paper. So it's quite not, e not easy to follow. Uh, and finally, the Clark-Maxwell reciprocal theorem uh, was used in a number of applications, uh, and I'm not going to that. But this, interestingly enough, is the is the relationship that still bears his name in in structural mechanics. When I learned structural mechanics, uh, we were taught to use the stru this uh, Clark Maxwell reciprocal theorem. So we've got three reciprocal ideas leading back to Maxwell. So, to give you a, a historical uh, perspective about what happened after that, about what happened to, to Ma uh, Maxwell's method. Neville Shute, in the mid-20th century, uh, before he became a novelist, was a very successful um, aeronautical engineer. He was in charge of the calculations for the R-100 airship under Barnes Wallace. And he said in his very good book, Slide Rule, a single calculation for a frame could take four weeks to complete. And it's very, very likely that it was Maxwell's method that he used to solve his, to solve these frames, one in four weeks. Now, look at the, what changed. It took Neville Shute and his team four weeks to solve seven unknowns. And in 1950, at the beginning of computers, you could do 10 unknowns in 10 minutes. But in 2006, you could do 800,000 unknowns in 10 minutes. Uh, now, there are two ways to solve indeterminate frames. This is the Maxwell method, the flexibility method, uh, where you write the equations of compatibility with forces unknowns. And the stiffness method is the reciprocal way of doing it, where you use the, the, the unknowns or the deflections, and you write equations of equilibrium. Now, as it happens, this latter one is the method that we find most useful, the flexibility method, 
maximal method doesn't is not so easy to to automate <coughs> and some people use it I believe but almost universally it's uh, it's it's the flexibility method that is used and it's used in the method of finite elements which d was derived from uh, uh, aeronautical engineering and it's uh, the method is a, is a the mathematicians don't like it because it's a bit of a sledgehammer approach you d you divide the the system up into elements and you write the equations of Librem f uh, uh, for these elements and you solve it. Uh, but it's a very, very successful method and our, our chairman uh, tells me that it's extensively used to solve Maxwell's equations on electronic, for electronics devices. It's, 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 it's a fairly white, it's a very common method to use for any system that you can express in terms of a, a, a and equations with boundary condition. Hi. So the, the final uh, contribution of Maxwell, uh, he, in a letter to William Thompson, Lord Kelvin, that, that later, uh, he wrote that he'd never seen any investigation of the question, given the mechanical strain in three directions on an element, when will it give way? And uh, he said that he'd strong reasons for believing that when the distortional strain energy of the element reaches a certain critical value, then the material would yield. Now, you may not have a very good understanding of, the to of what the torsional strain energy, distortional strain energy means, but don't worry about it too much. I don't fully understand it myself. <coughs> so so this, this, tech, this method was later on checked. Maxwell did not do the, do the experiment to, to develop it. And therefore, quite maybe sensibly, he didn't, he didn't publish it because it was only a conjecture that he had, but he was spot on. And uh, in the early 20th century, Richard von Mises and others checked it out and they found that the, if you used the distortional strain energy of a, from the tension test, or normal tension test, and equated that to the, 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 what the, these equations, then that's a good criterion. Now here is a... a, a finite element system that I use from time to time. I haven't used this particular thing actually, but look, plastic uh, uh, analysis, uh, stress potential type von Mises. So it's a standard technique so, uh, that is now used in, in, in the solving structures that may behave plastically. So he, uh, he it's a very, very clever insight that he had. Uh, so we asked the question, why did Maxwell spend time on structural mechanics? Well, he was a, a very practical man. I think he would have been a great engineer, but the poor guy had no chance of studying uh, engineering at that time because engineering degrees didn't come in till the 1870s. So, uh, <laughs> in structural engineering, we say that doctors can kill one person at a time, <coughs> but structural engineers can kill, have the potential to kill thousands. This is the roof of a stadium in Hartford, Connecticut in the States, 1978, and it collapsed, fortunately at night. And, the, 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 and there was no one killed or injured, but the, this roof fell due to a modeling error because they got errors in the, in the analysis uh, model that they used to, to check the strength of it. Right, and so uh, that's, uh, so it failed. So. The introduction of structural mechanics in the 19th century made a major difference to society. Structural failures, especially bridge, fail bridge failures, become uncommon. Structural mechanics may be the most used sector of applied science. Uh, again, our, our, in conversation with our chairman, he suggests maybe, um, uh, um, uh, what was it, Jim? The, uh, Circuit theory. Circuit theory may be more, more used, but anyway, it's, it's used all the time by lots of people. Maxwell may have understood its importance, and he turned the searchlight of his genus onto structural mechanics and made a major contribution to it. Thank you very much. Uh, we can remain standing for a couple of questions. Oh, yes, of course, yeah. Down, yep, yep. We have time for a couple of questions. 
Oh, yeah. Michael. Thank you very much for a magnificent talk, which I think I understood. Um, but I did notice at the beginning you had triangle, square, and a pentagon. You never got onto the pentagon. And I've got good reasons for asking, but I'd like to know what your answer is. Right. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll explain that. Uh, here we go. Um, here we go. The reason why. Uh, wait a minute, here we go. I missed it, haven't I? Here we go. The reason why there. Oh, beg your pardon. Or why there are no. There are only triangles there is that you may say, okay, there's, there are five leading in there, that's your, that's your idea. Why is there not a pentagon for that? Well, the answer is there's no load in these two members there. So there are, only th there are only three members with load coming into that point. And the, other, the two horizontal members, in this particular case of loading, don't take any load. So you, don't, you, only, need, you only get a triangle out of it. But if, these, if you applied other types of loading to the structure and got loading in, uh, in these members, you know, it would be a pentagon. I think, yes? I think you'd find the pentagon turning up, but it's more difficult to solve. Say, say again? You'd find the pentagon turning up, but it needs an elliptic function to solve it. Yes. Any other questions? Right here in the second row. Well, first uh, remark, the uh, finite element method is well accepted now in the mathematical community. Yes. And it's really in some way taken off, especially recently, by advanced mathematical methods uh -huh. like homology theory coming yes. in too. So for those mathematicians in the room and non-mathematicians, you know, tick the box, it's a well accepted <laughs> We are developing I, theory. I, I only meant to mention that, that when it came in at first, the, I, I, certainly some mathematicians were a bit critical of oh it. Oh yeah, but that's and historically... It was a bit impure. That's historically but, been but the case. But the engineers then said, oh, okay, you solve this problem then yeah. for me. I mean, and I, okay, I can't do I mean, it. <laughs> Dirac brought in the delta function before mathematicians accepted it, but now mm -hmm. it's a well-accepted concept yeah. also yes. in so mathematics. It's, it's but the question I have relates to this uh, principle of contragedience. Or contragedience, contra yes. To, to what extent is that related to the principle of virtual work? Ah, good question. Uh, the, let me see if I can go back here. Uh, no, forward. The, the Clapeyron's theorem is... Uh, a, where are we? Uh, clap, oh, here we go, here. Yes, that's it. Clapeyron's theorem is effectively the principle of virtual work. And you can get to the point, the, the, the contragredience thing directly from the principle of virtual work, and you don't really need, uh, well, it's the principle of work that underlies all these things. And uh, that's the, the magic, I didn't go into that, but that's also a magic concept, I believe. I look at, I look at things that were invented, like the reciprocal diagrams, I think I might have worked that one out myself. I don't think I could have worked out a, reciprocal, the, the principle of virtual work. And effectively, Maxwell didn't call it that, but that's what he's doing in, in creating the principle of contributions, yes. Good point. We have time for one more question. Here in the second row. Other side, yeah. Mine's more a comment than a question. I mean, you, you mentioned Barnes-Wallace helping to design yes. the R100, and it was perfectly stable. The R101, they put an extra bay in at the last moment, uh -huh. and it crashed on its maiden voyage. Yes, yes. Well, uh, that's uh, what slide rule explains this. Uh, uh, Mac, uh, um, uh, Neville Schutt says that one of the problems was that they had the good engineers. He, he was a bit boastful, I suppose, but certainly Barnes Wallace is a great genius, and the people at Farnborough who did the 101 didn't have such good people. So getting the, right, getting the people with the right competence is very important. Yeah. Let's thank you one more time. Yeah.